you join me today at the wheel of the latest incarnation of my own car. This is the Mercedes C-Class C200. This is the S205, or W205 if it was the sedan. That makes sense, doesn't it? Or, or not. December 2013 was a sad time for lovers of the S and W204 C-Class Mercedes because that was when the S and W205 were released. With production starting in February 2014 in Bremen, gone with the sharp, chiseled, angular looks of what is arguably the greatest C-Class ever in terms of build quality, and in came the svelte, swoopy, curvy lines of the new car, designed to sort of fit in the family look of the W222 S-Class with its curving, curviness, really. Designer Robert Lesnick was actually responsible for the S-Class as well. So you can sort of see how he's easily translated his bigger cars lines onto Mercedes best-selling model here in the middle size C-Class. Although you may notice that the new C-Class, the 205, is actually a little bit bigger. Because the CLA is now slotted in between the A-Class and the C-Class, they've grown it just a little bit more to make it a bit more grown up and a bit more S-Class-like. So this is the estate one, the S205. S standing for station wagon. W which is the saloon, doesn't stand for saloon. W stands for wagon, because car, and station wagon, no. The ones that do make sense are the Acti, which is the convertible, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, and the Coupe, which is a C205. So that one makes sense. One out of four, it's pretty bad, really. This being the estate car, I would actually argue is better looking than the saloon version. Around the front, it's a dramatic and exciting grrr, front of a car. Lots of presence, which we'll talk about in a second. It swoops through the back. You've got these big, curvaceous flanks curving in and out, undulating all over the place. Lots of design detail going on there. He had a busy day with his Etch-a-Sketch. And here, you see how the, the line curves down, giving the impression of it swooping down quite dramatically. But in fact, it doesn't. It carries on up here. And then kind of comes to a, a quite nicely resolved back end. The saloon version looks a little bit like a cross between an S-Class and a slot plug and it kind of just drops away and doesn't really work. It's not a bad looking back end but it doesn't really look like it belongs with the front end over there. So the uh, estate car I think is a better looking proposition. More practical as well if you're going to buy a Mercedes buy an estate car. Estate cars are cool. There are three main trim levels on this car, SE, Sport and AMG line, and there are three different faces on this car. Everything, there's so many options and differences and possibilities. There's three kinds of headlights you can have on this, basic halogen, LED and a different kind of LED. And also there's multiple grills you can have. Now I'm really quite thankful this car has got the big Mercedes star because there's a smaller, more genteel grill, but it really doesn't work on this big front. It just looks a bit out of place. See there are blanking areas here, so there's other options for air scoops and fog lights you can spend a lot of time on the configurator making one of these exactly how you want it. Now here's the business end of the estate, the boot. Now there's multiple ways of getting in here. First of all, there's the obvious handle under here. You can also use the key fob to open it and you can also use the button on the front on the driver's door because it's just a multifunctional, clever, lots of, yeah, just stuff. You know where I'm going with this. Now, this isn't actually the biggest boot in its class by a long way. In fact, I haven't measured it, but it looks a bit smaller than the W204, sorry, S204 estate boot. It looks a bit narrower to me. With the seats up, it's 490 litres of space. With the seats down, it's 1,510. The one thing that's quite handy is this little load space cover, which automatically slides up the C-post, or D-post actually, so it's an estate car, um, as you open the boot. So that's quite nice and lifts itself out of the way. In fact, if you want to remove it completely, you can pull it down and out and lift out the bar if you're folding the seats down, turning it into a transit van, which it will do very well indeed. In fact, speaking of folding it down, this is a great back seat. It's a 60-20-20 um, folding seat so you can have multi configurations and flipping it down is ease in itself. There's a button here and there's a button beside the seat as well. In terms of storage, again they've gone downhill a bit since the 204. There's a netted area on the left where we can put small amounts of cargo and there's just a recess here. On the 204 it's a nice covered cupboard area so you can tuck stuff away and not, in, fact, in, in my car I keep this kind of stuff in the little cupboard out of the way so I don't have that rattling around the boot. You do have a curry hook on both sides so you can hang bags up 
and uh, under the boot there's lots of space. There is actually room to put a space saver spare tyre, but it comes with an annoying pump instead. Okay, this is a pre-facelift car because everything changed in 2018 and this is a 2017. But this is a, one of the most popular engines in the range, the two litre four cylinder turbocharged petrol. It makes 180 um, horsepower and 300 newton meters of torque. And that gives it a nought to 60 time of 7.5 seconds, which in a car this big with a two litre petrol, is pretty rapid. Ah, right, oh, it's good to be out of the sun, finally. Although, having said that, this car's got the full panoramic roof, so we're not completely out of the woods as far as the sun is concerned. I will take the hat off though, because it's warm and uncomfortably warm. Right, this is an extremely comfortable car. The two main rivals for this thing will be the Audi A4 and the BMW 3 Series. And it's always been that the Audi has had the nicest interior and the BMW has been the nicest to drive, but the Mercedes has been kind of the most luxurious in its own posh kind of way. But now this C-Class has kind of stepped up to try and take a few of those mantles away in some ways. So the interior, you feel like you're in an E or an S-Class looking around your, your surroundings. This door card has got this lovely swathe of aluminium leading up to the memory seat function of the electric seats. So this is one, two, three, four, so eight-way electric seats on both sides. And they're three-stage heated as well. The nice aluminium metal finish continues here into the door. You've got a lovely sculpted door handle, electric window switches are all solid metal as well, and your electric mirror switches which fold the mirrors in and out as well as adjusting them are metal too. It's a very, very classy thing. In the bottom of the door, you've got very decent sized, generous um, storage bins with cup holder or bottle holders in the front as well. And a nice touch Mercedes gives you is this little button down here in the front of the driver's door, which allows you to open the tailgate from the driver's seat. Handy if you're picking up someone from the station or if you're picking up someone from the shops and they can just run in, dump stuff in the boot, you can have it all ready and waiting for them. A lot of the controls do kind of look familiar in their sort of style and location. For example, the headlight and fog light switch is down here to above your right knee, or beyond your left knee in a left-hand drive car, which has not changed from the previous generation car. The steering wheel looks kind of similar, but an evolution. It looks a little bit more sporty and a little bit more curvy. This uh, F1 inspired centre section kind of comes at you with the Mercedes star. And of course, you've still got your main function stalk on the left hand side, which does wipers, lights, indicators, pretty much everything. So it's very easy to drive down the motorway flashing like crazy at the van in front when you're actually trying to just wash the windscreen. Now being an automatic and with the 9G Tronic 9-speed auto, the automatic transmission shifter is here on the right hand side of the steering wheel. Here where the wipers would be on a regular car, so don't go for that gear shift when you want to put the wipers on if you're not used to this particular car. It's a pretty simple thing to use, up for reverse, down for drive, but on the end for park. There's more stuff behind the steering wheel. You've got paddle shift for taking manual control of the gear shift as well. Uh, paddle left is down, paddle right is up. And then there's more. Also around here, you've got an electrical gubbin to move the steering wheel in and out and up and down. And there's more. You've got the other one down here for the cruise control, really well and truly hidden behind the stalk of the steering wheel itself. Um, I don't think this is a great position or layout. You can't read any of the labels on it at all. So you, unless you've learnt it by, by heart, you're gonna to struggle to do that safely without driving into something. The steering wheel is nice, it's lovely soft leather, with a kind of perforated bit in the center section where you grip it when you're driving most of the time. And lots of controls on it for the radio, for the telephone, for the trip computer. And incidentally, the dials are lovely and clear. I don't think they're quite as nice as in the previous generation, which looked a little bit kind of jewelry-esque with their kind of silver edges, which it's still got, but it's a bit more discreet. But there's a big color LCD in the center of between the speedo and the rev counter, which holds absolutely everything else, apart from the indicator lights, which are two separate little green arrows at the top of that area. Now we've got the center section. This particular car has got a seven inch screen. Up to 2018, the biggest screen you could get was eight and a half inches. Now you can go to around 10 inches on the biggest, latest version of this. But this particular screen is something I've never really liked in this generation. The interior was designed in their advanced design studio in Lake Como in Italy. So I'm sure they spent a long time working out all the details and minute of where everything was gonna go. So I'm imagining this must be deliberate, but it just looks like such an afterthought that I don't know, it's never really worked as far as I'm concerned. It looks like something you should be able to take off and take with you in your bag, but obviously you can't, it's bolted to the dashboard. The three big vents below look very kind of industrial, a bit like the beginning of Men in Black, with a massive airflow coming through you. They look quite classy with a piano black 
and the little kind of aluminium knurled bit, very kind of jet plane-y kind of design. Um, it looks great all piano black plastic at the moment. This car's only got about 16,000 miles on it though, so I'd really like to see a high mileage example to see exactly how that has stood the test of time. I suspect it may look a bit kind of hazy and not too special after a couple of years. Now below that, it's all very minimalistic. You can sort of see the Italian style coming through. This single row of metal switches. It's all your ventilation controls. You've got dual zone climate, so the end most buttons on both sides are the temperature up and down, and all your fan speed, your air conditioning, recirculation, that kind of stuff. And the center, the biggest one, is the menu for the screen and the computer. Below that, you've got really the most minimal bit of radio and navigation possible, frankly. Navi radio media, just the, and tell, telephone, obviously. Uh, it's just virtually nothing, but the thing is, it creaks when you push it. A Mercedes shouldn't creak. This all just feels a little bit, bit cheap. Well, this plastic does feel plasticky because it's plastic. I said earlier, the W204 was the best built C-Class ever. And I'm sure this car is supremely reliable, but in terms of fit and finish, this does feel like a step down from the old car. To get to the rest of your radio, media, and navi controls, you actually have to bypass this area here and go to this turny wheel dial knob thing and a touchpad that you can write on. Um, even the volume control for the radio is a slightly awkwardly positioned for the passenger anyway. The little drum wheel on the right. If I was designing this car, I would swap these two controls. I would put the volume away from the driver so the passenger has easy access to it because this one here which the passenger doesn't need is your drive mode selector so dynamic sport comfort or eco you toggle it up and down to change modes which changes the steering response the um, suspension the engine response all the usual things you expect with those kind of things but why would the passenger need it that's the driver control now here in the center i have two massive cup holders the uh, furious driving cup test this is the tea shelf it's very much a, a tea cavern frankly you've got two big big cup holders which even this cup which i've been told is a bucket uh, is, is slightly loose and sloppy in these big big tea cup holders and there's a bit of a cavern behind there for other stuff and a 12 volt socket and carrying over from the previous generation you've got a double-sided flippy open massive massive area for stuff here in the center armrest which also has two usb ports hidden underneath all of the stuff which is currently uh, living in it up here in the ceiling by the controls for the uh, sunroof blinds we've got a sunglasses holder now this actually is where the manual gear shift would have been. Although as far as I can tell, uh, they no longer offer a manual gear shift. Only the very earliest, that 2014, 2015 cars were available with a manual. I think the very basic entry level car, which is a 1.6 petrol, actually sourced from Renault, uh, can be had with a manual gearbox. But I don't think anyone buys that engine because why would you buy a C-Class, the 1.6? Unless you're really up against it for tax. Right, let's look in the back. Despite the car being fairly large and I believe bigger than the previous generation, it's actually harder to get in and out of and the bench seat feels smaller. I'm quite surprised at this. I've got decent tow room, but my knees haven't got a great deal of space. Um, because this has got the twin panoramic sunroofs, um, the headroom isn't that good. I'm not actually touching it, but it just feels a little bit enclosed. Fortunately, we've got this really nice white Artico leather interior, which lightens the whole thing up, makes it feel a bit bigger, a bit more spacious. It's a nice little optical effect going on there. We've got the same nice aluminium line door inserts with the speakers. The speakers are surprisingly small, but I'm imagining they've done some clever audio work to make it very good indeed. Uh, same nice sculpted metal door handles and metal window switches and another cup holder slash door bin down here, which is quite, quite generous as well. And the backs of both seats has got big elasticated bins so you can put lots of big stuff in there. And you do have twin air vents here so you can move these liable vents left and right for both passengers, turn the vent up and down. We don't have those, a 12 volt socket or more usefully USBs because if you're going to have kids in the back they're going to have iPads, Nintendos and you want power for those things and there's just none until you reach the boot where there is more power in the boot but again it's not here is it? Safety is actually very good in this car. It got one of the highest scores ever recorded when it was tested in Euro NCAP. And it's actually got seven airbags. I can see two of them here in the uh, seat posts above my head. So if anything was to go badly wrong, I'd be fairly well off in this car. There is a brilliant pull down armrest, which is not only a big armrest, it's a big felt lined cubby hole, which has got a pair of uh, cup holders in it as well. So much T shelfage going on here in the back of the car. And uh, also worth noting in order to amuse the kids, 
if you look at the uh, rear air vents from here, it does look like a slightly happy robot. Now, you still get a Mercedes key, same as you did on the uh, other generations and older cars, but you don't actually have to put it anywhere because this car has a start-stop button on it. Yes, another of my bugbears and things that I hate are start-stop start, stop button. Now, as well as the drive select being up here on the steering column, column shift down into drive, two clicks. You've still got your ridiculous park brake down here, but it's now electronic, so you just flick the little electronic switch and you are away. Oh. You could spend a lot of time adjusting the seats and playing with them and then memorizing them into your perfect position because there are so many adjustments. Now the ride, I'm currently in comfort mode I believe, is extremely smooth. Okay, this is quite a narrow um, road for a road test, I have to say. And the steering is very light indeed. Let's kind of push this up a mode or two. We're in comfort, let's go to sport. There we go, that tightens things up considerably and instantly dropped a gear with a bit of a shunt. So up until now in comfort mode, the gear shifts have been virtually seamless. Now, can we take over manually? Let's drop a gear or two. We're in uh, fourth at the moment. That was interesting, I manually shifted to third, prodded the accelerator, and it still did a kick down into, into second. And because I've done nothing for a moment or two with the paddles, it's gone back to drive again. See, why I th this is why I think paddles are completely useless, because the car just does what it wants regardless. Now, do a blind crest, so we get to give it a 0 to 60 run. That is rapid and it is very smooth indeed. I mean, I'm impressed at the smoothness of the gear changes. I am a little bit bored though, if that makes sense, because you know, I would like to be doing those gear changes myself, having better fun with it. If you're gonna be driving that way, you are probably gonna be wanting to punch through a gear shift, which is my, my biggest bugbear with this entire car. I, I do like a lot of things about this car, but with no manual option anywhere on the list, it would put me off buying one. Now, this car is, though, a remarkably popular vehicle built in nine factories around the world, which is a lot of factories. So as well as Sport, it's also got Sport Plus, which livens things up even more, gives you very, very sharp throttle response indeed. Move this back into regular Sport. It's not bad. It's probably the best compromise between comfort, which is too comfortable, and Sport Plus, which is too sporty. This is your Goldilocks mode. The steering in this mode is quite nice and sharp. It obviously, it's disc brakes all round, goes without saying, and steering rack, obviously electric power steering, goes without saying. Independent suspension all the way around as well. Multi-link independent front and rear. So they are really giving BMW a run for their money in terms of handling now, because the thing does grip and corner incredibly well. Now I've driven into some shady areas, you can see all the ambulant lighting, sorry, ambient lighting. The way the needles glow red is quite impressive. And there are options to change the lighting effects around the car. In fact, when you open the door and climb in in the dark, the word Mercedes-Benz glows at you from your, your sill tread plate thing. This is very smooth and quiet on the road. We're only doing 30 miles an hour now, so I'm not expecting a great deal of noise. There are lots of engine and transmission options, going from the 1.6 petrol up to the V8 AMG C versions of this car, which are just ridiculous and crazy vehicles for having lots of hoonigan fun in. There are also four-wheel drive options, and now there are hybrid and mild hybrid versions as well. The 300E is actually quite an impressive beast. I believe there are mild hybrid versions of things like the C200 now as well, in the current range. Everything was facelifted and changed in 2018, so just a short time after this car was built, where they revised the engine lineup and they revised a lot of the interior, the infotainment, everything updated. So it's virtually a new car after 2018. So if you're looking at a second-hand one, a 2017 gets you a lot of good technology for a lot less money. 
One thing you don't get though is Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Not a standard anyway. That's still a £300 option if you want it. One thing it does come with a standard now though is Mercedes Me, which is a really cool Bluetooth link to your phone and that keeps track of where the car is. It can geofence it so if the car moves from a particular location, it will alert your phone. It'll keep track of your, your journey. So if you're claiming expenses, uh, you can fill in your expenses logs based on that. Hmm, nice bit of fly tipping there. Now these seats are astonishingly comfortable. This one has the additional extra knee support, which is an optional extra on this particular car. There's loads of other standard kit on this thing, as well as auto lights, auto wipers. You've got uh, accident collision avoidance, radar adaptive cruise, and all the states now come with a reversing camera as standard. This car does feel bigger than the old 204 chassis. I guess thanks to the uh, slightly more bulbous bodywork. And longer overhangs, but it is a fun car to drive still. It's remarkably uh, pliant on the road. Sport mode works very well in terms of controlling the body and giving you decent feedback of what the car's doing. Now apparently the owner normally drives in eco mode and that generally returns mid 40s MPG, which isn't bad from a petrol car of this size. Let's try takeoff in Sport Plus. Oh, the back end going out a little bit there. Yeah, it's, it's rapid enough, I'll give it that. On paper, it's actually a little bit slower than my C250 diesel from 2010, but in practice, it's not a lot in it in the real world. As well as Sport and Sport Plus, you also have an individual mode where you can start fiddling around, changing your steering settings and your damping settings and your throttle response, uh, so you can fine tune the car to precisely how you want it, and then leave, hopefully leave it in that setting forever and ever. If you've made it exactly how you want it, of course. I haven't driven many nine-speed autos before, but I have to say this one is very smooth and handles the changes up and down very well. I was kind of half expecting it to get a bit lost and uh, be wandering up and down between gears an awful lot more than it actually is, where it's kind of pondering whether fifth, sixth or seventh might be the right gear for this corner. In fact, it seems to be pretty good at choosing a gear and sticking with it and not really messing around, just finding the right gear and staying there. Now forward visibility is pretty good out of the car. These A-posts are huge and sweep right back virtually into the, your temple as you're sitting here in the driver's seat. Uh, but you've got good side visibility even though the waistline is very high indeed. You do, it's kind of almost level with my shoulders. I feel like, I feel like a kid sitting in their dad's car kind of thing. And uh, looking at the back of the car, um, the rear window is actually quite small and my view out of it is a little bit restricted because of that. Which is why you get the reverse backup camera. But that aside, you generally get quite a good clear view of the road, although the bonnet is quite long and does swoop away quite heavily, so it would take a little bit of learning to, to figure out precisely where the corners are. But of course it does have front and rear parking sensors as standard, so you should be fine. Hopefully not knocking into too many things I want this corner. So the question is, did Mercedes manage to build a car which actually beats the rivals BMW and Audi? Well, I would say this interior is nicer looking than an Audi interior. I'm not sure the materials are as good as Audi might use, but it does look very impressive indeed. It's very elegant, absolutely beautiful apart from this silly screen. In terms of driving dynamics, I think it kind of depends on the engine. Um, but yeah, I think they've really done a lot to improve the chassis of the C-Class over the years. Certainly the 204 was a rival for the, uh, for the 3 Series. I'm gonna say yeah, I reckon they've definitely matched it. So now you can have a bit more class, a bit more elegance. No one's ever gonna say you're an Audi driver or Audi driver equivalent when you're in a C-Class. This is something else. This is a rarefied thing. Once you've driven a Mercedes or owned a Mercedes, you don't really want to buy a different make of car after that for some reason. 
you do become a Mercedes driver. Well, thanks for joining me on a fine sunny afternoon out in the current C-Class Mercedes C200 petrol estate S2045. S2045, I keep calling it 204. Thank you for joining me on this modern Monday in a modern Mercedes. I hope you've enjoyed, hope it's been enlightening. Uh, if it's been good, please hit like, please hit subscribe if you haven't already, and join me again next time for whatever else I'm driving, modern or retro or something, no doubt. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Uh -huh.